Frogs can be found in a wide variety of habitats, from forests to underground to freshwater ecosystems. Regardless of where they live, frogs are amphibians, which means that they can live in water and on land. In fact, most frogs start out as larvae in the water, although some species have adapted to bypass this. This ability to live on land and in water means that frogs are a host to a number of anatomical and physiological adaptations. So let's start learning about frog anatomy. The frog's body is covered with a thin skin. This keeps the outsides outside and the insides inside, but this isn't all that the skin does. Let's start with the color. Frogs come in a wide variety of colors. Everything from I'm hiding green to hey buddy, I dare you to eat me, red. Why wouldn't all frogs want camouflage, which is also known as crypsis? Being brightly colored can serve as a warning to potential predators. Some species of frogs secrete toxins from their skin, which allows them to be a little less covert. This is called aposomatic coloring. The bright colors can also help mates to find them. Toxins aren't the only thing that the frog skin secretes. If you've ever picked up a frog, you'd notice they're a little slimy. This is because the skin secretes mucus. Since the frog skin has a high surface area and is thin and a little slimy, this makes it a great surface for gas exchange. If this reminds you of worms, great job, because these same features allow the worm to have gas exchange across its skin. Let's look at the frog's eye. It's covered with a nictitating membrane, which is a clear skin-like membrane that acts as a third transparent eyelid. It protects the eye from debris if the frog is underwater or burrowed in the mud. And the frog's eyes get a whopping 360 degrees of vision, which means the frog can see all the way around its body. When we look at frog's legs, you can see these long toes with bulbs at the end of them. In some species, these toes help the frogs walk up walls using van der Waal forces. Even if the frog isn't doing a Spider-Man impression, these long toes and the webbing between them make them excellent at swimming. Now let's look at the back legs. We can see some specializations that help the frog as it jumps along. The legs make up nearly a quarter of the frog's mass. Kermit does not skip on leg day. The bones of the rear leg are elongated, allowing the leg to create levers capable of quick, long distance jumps. The tendons that hold the muscles to the bones in these frogs are adapted to store energy like a spring that's compressed. When the frog jumps, this combination of springy tendons, strong muscles, and long bones work like a catapult. Some species have a different leg structure, and that means that they're not all amazing jumpers. While we're talking about muscles, it's worth taking a second and talking about the frog's tongue. You may know that frogs catch their prey by shooting their tongue out and grabbing it. This happens faster than you can blink your eye. The frog tongue is specialized. The muscles are able to extend up to 130% of their resting length and have a super sticky saliva that can hold more than the frog's body weight. These muscles, like in all other systems, are excited by nerves. We've already talked about the eye, so let's take a look at the rest of the frog's nervous system. This is the tympanic membrane, or the ear of the frog. They don't do all that riveting for nothing. This helps them hear the calls of other frogs by transmitting sound vibrations to the inner ear where they're translated into nerve signals processed by the brain. Speaking of the brain, see this walnut looking thing? That's the brain. Yes, the whole brain. Frogs are not working with much. Even so, their brain is capable of processing sensory information and generating motor commands. It's divided into three creatively named sections, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Nerves traveling to and from the brain are contained within the spinal cord. And like in humans, the skull protects the brain and the spinal cord is protected by the vertebrae. The frog skeleton is a bit different than ours. We have seven cervical or neck vertebrae and the frog only has one. What can we say? Frogs don't have a neck, and there's actually a really good reason for this. With that big, heavy head and those powerful jumping capabilities, if they did have a neck, they'd get whiplash every time they jumped. 
So they have a lot fewer vertebrae in general, and in some species this is as few as five. This provides the frogs with a rigid core that's less vulnerable during jumping movement. The frog pelvis has some unique specializations as well. One is this bone called the urostyle, which originates from what would have been the tail evolutionarily. Together with the unique shape of the pelvis, this gives the frog more oomph when it jumps. But if we have all that oomph, we've got to have good landing gear. The frog has robust scapulae and a fused radius and ulna that act as shock absorbers when jumping. Frogs also have no ribs. This isn't because they're afraid of becoming barbecue, it's because they use a different method of breathing where they swallow air and then push it out. This is different than our suction pump breathing where we make the chest cavity bigger to suck air in. While this isn't the most efficient way to breathe, it is efficient for sound production. But remember that frogs don't have to rely on just their lungs. They can breathe using their skin. Why have two ways to breathe? Well, it's hard to use your lungs when you're underwater or buried in mud. When using their lungs to breathe, air enters the glottis and passes through the larynx on the way to the lungs. Similar to us, sound production happens within the larynx when air is used to vibrate the vocal cords. And gas exchange happens in the lungs. Frogs also have a vocal sac, which is involved in amplifying their ribbits, but it's not part of breathing. So when you see that vocal sac inflating, the frog is trying to communicate or look more attractive. What moves that oxygen around? The blood, of course. Like in humans, arteries move blood away from the heart and veins bring it in. Unlike in humans, the frog has a three-chambered heart with two atria and one ventricle. This means that the deoxygenated blood on the right side of the heart and the oxygenated blood on the left side of the heart are gonna mix a little bit. But this isn't a huge issue for the frog because they're able to breathe using their skin and this is used to partially oxygenate the deoxygenated blood before it reaches the heart. So it's kind of like deoxygenated light. The blood exits the ventricle through the truncus arteriosus, which splits into three aortic arches, the carotid, the systemic, and the pulmocutaneous. This takes the blood to the brain, system, and lungs and skin, respectively. The deoxygenated blood then returns to the heart through the vena cavae, but some of it will stop by the skin to get oxygenated through the use of small capillaries that are near the surface. Oxygen isn't the only nutrient that frogs need. Food enters through the oral cavity and then goes to the esophagus, then the stomach, then the small intestine, large intestine, and cloaca and anus. Note the smallness of the large intestine. This is because in most animals, it absorbs water and electrolytes. But as frogs live in water, they don't really need to be that concerned with absorbing it. Frogs also store extra nutrients in masses of fat called fat bodies, and they use those during hibernation or mating season. Breaking down food into nutrients takes enzymes and bile. Like in humans, bile is created by the liver and stored in the gallbladder. And in the gallbladder, that's where this bile is concentrated. The bile breaks fats down into easier to digest globs. The pancreas secretes a host of digestive enzymes that aid in the breakdown of food. And it also produces insulin and glucagon, which help to regulate blood sugar levels. The liver filters toxins from the blood and produces a glucose storage molecule called glycogen. When things are broken down, some material is usable and some is waste. How do we get rid of wastes? Kidneys filter wastes, electrolytes, specifically getting rid of nitrogenous wastes, ammonia and urea. Ammonia is toxic and it needs to be diluted, but if you live in the water, your friends are less likely to notice if you're going a little bit more often. Urea takes an extra metabolic step and needs to be diluted as well, but not as much as ammonia. This means it can be held in the body for a short period of time. So frogs have a bladder, but it's really small. It's probably not a good idea to road trip with Kermit. Wastes created in the kidneys travel to the bladder through the ureters. When it's time to excrete, the urine exits through the cloaca like everything else that exits the frog. 
Anterior to the frog's kidneys are the adrenal glands. Yours sit on top of your kidneys. Regardless of where they're at, the adrenal glands secrete hormones such as norepinephrine and adrenaline that are involved in homeostasis, which is my favorite topic in the entire world, but we're not gonna talk about it today. And while we're in the nether regions, it's time to talk about reproduction. Frogs reproduce sexually, and the action happens outside of their bodies. The female produces eggs in their ovaries, and these get released often by the thousand. Most of the time, sperm is provided by males. This is generated in the testes and released through the cloaca onto the female's eggs. In many species, the magic happens externally, making tadpole babies. But some have internal fertilization, and some can perform parthenogenesis, which means that the eggs can develop even without fertilization. To make sure everything happens at the right time, the males will make their characteristic croaks and the egged up ladies will come a running. The females will judge certain traits of the male call to determine who has the most desirable genes. And that concludes our walkthrough of frog anatomy and adaptations. Be sure to check out the lab activity and other resources in the description below. And you don't have to stop with the frog. We have three other dissectable models in visible biology, a sea star, an earthworm, and a pig. With animal structure and function units, you can compare invertebrate and vertebrate body systems and see how evolution shaped anatomy. Thanks so much for joining me today. See you next time. Thank you.